Hi. Hello. So, Jacob, it is. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm I'm honored to to be here with you and to speak with you and to hope like just have a place for you to share your story and share this remarkable remarkable um, journey that you you are on because you're still you're still in the you're still in it. I'm still in the journey. It's a lifelong journey. Yes, yes. Well, and I really appreciate um, you and having me on, Nathaniel. That's beautiful. Thank you. So for all those who are just tuning in or are going to watch this, um, I'm Nathaniel Woods, and this is Jacob, uh, Jacob Duncan. And mm -hmm. what this is a, this is a story. We're going to tell a story, but it's, this is a, uh, personal story about how miracles can happen and how miracles do happen and how someone was given a life-threatening diagnosis and they completely um, tr trusted the process that of the modern medical system and went through those steps and it what happened was uh, it didn't work and we're going to get into that and those details and then um, through your own strength intuition and trusting yourself was able to overcome and, and find some strategies some techniques and some, some real big faith that actually led you to being, um, to being a, a medical miracle per se. So uh, <laughs> this is, this is going to be part of the series of the um, 30 days of miracle healings, uh, mm -hmm. miraculous healings, because uh, my goal and mission in this series is going to be to show hundreds maybe hundreds dozens of other people who have their own journey who i don't know i've not worked with personally or i have and that have that have overcome chronic illness uh, debilitating disease um, di debilitating diagnoses and overcome the root cause of it and found the root cause so yes. today our featured my, my my honored guest is um jacob duncan and she is from you're in Canada you're currently I'm on Vancouver Island in Canada yes and so we're gonna get right into it um, you were you are an author uh, of a book called healed by cancer and has yes. just released I'm so happy for you so I'm nice. super excited yeah I just released this weekend and um, for those of those who really want to get to this or the audiobook, we'll have links in the description for this, but uh, later. But we're going to focus on the the, ju the juice and the meat of the of what journey, what what happened, and um, basically this all starts with your diagnosis in 2007. Um, can you can you just give us some background? What was going on in your life at, around that time? And what what were you like back then? Because clearly you're not that person now. I am definitely not that person. No, I have recreated myself actually and let go of a lot of programs. So in 2007, I uh, found out that I had breast cancer and I, not really knowing any better, decided, okay, I need to have that tumor removed and uh, I need to have treatments. I didn't really want to have chemotherapy, but I had two young children and there was a lot of fear. And uh, I kind of... You said there was a lot of fear, and then you said you found out. Well, how, how did it come to where you even look? Because a lot of people go through right. it, they're not even looking. How did that They're happen? not looking. So my mother was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 37. And so many people said to me, you make sure you get mammogrammed every year because you're you know, more susceptible to it, the whole genetic thing. And so that instilled a fear a, and a belief system as well. And so I was going since the age of 20, they don't recommend that at all anymore, by the way, but back then, since the age of 20, I was getting a mammogram every year. And at this age of 38, so I was a year older than my mother, is when I found out that I did have breast cancer. Wow. Okay, so yes. question, the obvious question is, do you feel or looking back now that there was any correlation to getting the mammogram yearly and developing cancer or your mother you being told all the time that you may have it yeah do you think there's any correlation 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I did so much inner work and uh, I follow Dr. Joe Dispenza, Dr. Bruce Lipton and the power of belief, you know, and all the well-meaning people that said to me, you better get checked. You're more susceptible. All of that instilled this belief. And my mother eventually passed away of cancer. And so I had a lot of fear around cancer and that belief uh, can has the power to turn on the cancer gene. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it did. And so I remember when I was diagnosed, the oncologist said to me, there is nothing you could have done to prevent this. And he said this to make me feel better. But instead, I felt so disempowered because I thought, if there's nothing I could have done, then I'm doomed. I'm gonna be like my mother and it's gonna come back and I'm gonna die from it. Wow. And then I read Dr. Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, and he just, you know, threw that theory out the window. Wow. And I was so relieved that it was, in fact, that belief, that fear of getting cancer that played a big role. And the fact that I mimicked my mother's behavior, her thought patterns, well, her tell reactions. Me that, tell, tell me that there's two questions. You mentioned that that what what changed about the fear like what was when you say there was fear was it um was it constant thoughts about it was it like worry was it anxiety what what was fear that you actually experienced back then oh it was there was a constant worry for sure and uh you know once a year you go for checkups and you're also anyone that's has gone through this, you know, whether you've had cancer before or there's cancer in the family, when you go for those checkups, you don't, you don't sleep for a couple of nights and, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of what ifs. And, um, I certainly, I certainly felt that I was a worrier big time, big mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So, yeah. so being worried, not sleeping and, and you were, would you say you were even creating, anticipating, and giving your energy towards the reality that you may have cancer? Absolutely, yep, mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, even to a point where you're imagining yourself already diagnosed. Wow. And then when I was diagnosed, I was imagining, you know, seeing the funeral, right? I, I even went there, so I went there. I'm just taking that in. <laughs> so all from someone telling you that there's nothing you could have done to do that to have to um people or people telling you you're susceptible you gotta yep. get checked you gotta yep. and so you so let me ask you this though if you were doing it for 10 years the mammograms for oh, longer well you said longer. from 20 to 38 20 to 38 so oh yeah sorry no that's 18 years let me get my math right <laughs> <laughs> no problem uh, so, so 18 years, you were, would it be safe to say or accurate um, if you were projecting that possibility? Well, and it, uh, let me just um, reiterate that a little bit. It, sure, sure. I wasn't necessarily conscious of the stress. Of course. It was subconscious. And so when I would go in for those um, exams, um, my nervous system would be under attack, but I wouldn't necessarily realize it because it was kind of part of my norm. And so when I did get the news, um, you know, that there's something there that we need to investigate and we want to do a biopsy, that's when I was like, oh my God, holy cow, right? Is this actually happening? And that's when my anxiety really went through the roof. And then after that first diagnosis, I went for mammograms every year for a few years, and then I stopped. Um, and those were awful. Those were awful because that's when I kept being so worried that the cancer was coming back. Wow. So before I, I, I know we're going to get into the, all the amazing good things that you've done to, to since then, but I just really want to get our people to understand like where you were, what was happening and how it was for you, because this is what maybe other people are going through. And this is what other people know other people are going through. Like this mm -hmm. is the real feeling. So when you said stress was normal for you, what did you mean by that? 
So at a subconscious level, I was vibrating at uh, a level of fear and I was a workaholic and I realized, so I, did, I put the microscope on myself um, and that is what healed me of cancer. I surrendered all of these behaviors, the limiting beliefs and the emotions that were attached to the behaviors. But essentially I realized that the undercurrent of all of my behavior was fear-based and fear of rejection was the number one. And so I was a workaholic because I needed to prove myself. And if I didn't prove myself, I wasn't worthy and I would be rejected. And I was an, an exerciser, you know, and, and exercising too much because if I wasn't fit, I would be rejected and people would judge me and I wasn't worthy. And, and then I struggled with an eating disorder uh, for many years as well. And so fear of rejection, lack of self-worth was um, at the root of all of my behavior. And so anyone that knew me thought that I was a pretty easygoing, laid back, happy person. But underneath, I was, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. I was a pressure cooker, actually. And so I fooled everyone, really, by saying, oh, no, I'm great. I covered all of my worries up with a smile. If I had any worries, I would shove them underneath. You know, I sweep them under the rug and pretend that everything was great. I played the game of denial. And, uh, but I, I also realized that I didn't just feel, I didn't just um, fool other people. I fooled myself. I fooled myself. And uh, over the past couple of years, I have learned a lot about what makes me tick and why I did what I did, all the different behaviors. This yeah. is so beautiful. I honor, I honor your vulnerability and, and your openness and your authenticity. To, this mm -hmm. is really, I mean, it makes so much sense. It's like, these are the things that make us sick at, internally um, that, that we don't account for, that the doctors aren't sitting there asking you. The, you know, they didn't ask you about how's your relationship. They didn't ask you about how's your relationship with your mom or your husband or how's your relationship to worry? How's your relationship to... You know, like right. they don't yeah. ask these questions nope. and they don't quite frankly, they don't care. Unfortunately, no. they're not trained. No. To, so, so, so the whole time you're going to the doctors, they don't acknowledge any of what could be going on underneath. And That's they, right. they, I mean, did they offer you drugs during the time? Did they offer you, what did they offer you? Well, in 2007, I had the surgery, I had chemotherapy, I had radiation, and then I went on um, hormone replacement therapy, tamoxifen, which was supposed to be five years. I did it for three years, and that's when I started to tap into my intuition a little bit more, and I stopped. My intuition said, you're done with the tamoxifen. Wow. Wow. They're very toxic. Tamoxifen okay. is very, oh, very toxic. So good. This is so good. What happened, did, did, you know a lot of people who uh, do those things, have cancer, sometimes they lose their hair? Yep, I did. Did you have any side effects of all the drugs at all? Did you have like how, how digestive? Yes, side so um, initially during, during the chemotherapy, I lost my hair. Um, I didn't uh, become as nauseous or as sick as some people. I think I was told that I had a really strong constitution and because I was a very health conscious person, I was, I kind of, I've often said, you know, I feel like a spring chicken when I wandered into the cancer clinic for my treatments, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, I was okay. I mean, I felt a little off, but you know, not, I wasn't like bedridden or anything. Yeah. So what I didn't know at the time was the long-term effects of chemotherapy. And so the year, about a, you know, the year after, I remember saying to my husband, I think I have chemo, I, I think I have uh, Alzheimer's. I was not able to remember anything. And people were coming up to me and saying, oh, remember, I told you this, this, and I told you that. And my kids even um, were getting upset with me because they're like, mom, I told you this. And I didn't remember. And my husband's like, you don't have Alzheimer's don't worry about it but then I started thinking I wonder if it has anything to do with chemotherapy so I started to google it and there were actually quite a few people who had complaints of 
the same sort. And I read that it can take 10 years before the memory um, repairs itself. It's been almost 13 years. My memory still isn't great. So I've surrendered it. I'm okay with it now. It is what it is. And, um, but that was one long-term effect that was, um, that I was never told about. Yeah. Wow. Remind me later to tell you uh, or to share with you about uh, an advanced brain connection that can help that. So we'll talk about that later, but remind me, let's talk about that. Oh, okay. I specialize in helping people with memory and okay. things like that. So. Okay, sure. Um, uh, so this is amazing. So beautiful. A lot of people who are going through your situation who, so let me ask you, did you ever, did you ever not trust your doctor? In 2007, I totally gave my power away. And I, they just bounced me around from one oncologist to another oncologist to a radiologist to the to the surgeon I was just bounced around and I I allowed that so I gave my power away and trusted them yes so tell me tell me then, exactly what you mean what exactly you mean when you say I gave my power away that I did not make any of the choices the choices were made for me mm. I wasn't asked nobody asked me and then in 2016, I had already done a lot of inner work and I had already, you know, learned to trust my intuition. And I thought, you know what, I am going to be, I'm going to be the one in the front seat. I'm going to drive this, this time around and be the one to make the decisions, whether it feels right for me or not right for me. And um, it was a completely different ballgame. I remember uh, I, I met with the surgeon and I, you know, I said, I said to him, I haven't decided yet whether or not I'm going to have surgery. And he just looked at me like, whoa, what do you mean? No, this is, you know, he just assumed like, yeah, you know, you're having surgery and this is going to be the date. And, and then um, I chose not to have surgery. Wow. And he probably spent a good half hour using the fear factor on me. Really? Well, hold yeah. On. So you, this is really good. This is really good. So you said that you started something and you changed. What was it that changed? You said you started trusting your intuition. Yes. So I started reading self-help books. I started to think, okay, I need it. So, you know, the biology of the belief was one of them and several of them. But then in 2013, I met the most amazing man and it was pivotal pivotal time of my life and uh, his name is Dr. Gabor Mate mm -hmm. and he works with a plant medicine called ayahuasca mm -hmm. and he told me about this retreat that he was offering in Mexico and I didn't know what ayahuasca was and he said go home google it and let me know if you're interested or not so I went home googled it and kind of freaked out because it's a psychedelic drugs and I, I I I didn't do drugs and I'm like whoa what is I'm not doing I'm not doing psychedelic drugs well, that was well, my some, reaction I will say for anyone who doesn't and, know some people call I would not call it drugs but yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, it, it's a plant medicine mm. psychedelic plant medicine but what you're, saying my, really my, what you're saying is really important because and the, on the internet a lot of people will call it a drug yes Yes. And, and I saw it's a drug. <laughs> yes. So then my husband said to me, do you trust Gabor? And I said, absolutely. 100%. He said, then you need to go. He said, you need to deal with your fear of cancer. You need to deal with your father. Cause I had, did not have a very good relationship. As a matter of fact, my father and I hadn't spoken for almost 10 years. He says, you need to go. And I said to my husband, well, we can't afford for me to go. It's too expensive. You know, it's going to be thousands of dollars. And he said to me, we can't afford for you not to go. And that hit me. That really hit me. Because here I was kind of in denial of so much. And when he said that, I was like, oh, okay. Wow. And it was the best thing that could have happened to me. As I did um, this, it was a one week retreat. There were three ceremonies there. And essentially what ayahuasca did for me was it allowed me 
to speak with my higher self. And it strengthened my connection with my higher self. And I have since done quite a few ayahuasca ceremonies. I've also done San Pedro or Washuma. It's also known as Washuma ceremonies. And I am now able to tap into my intuition very easily. I don't need to have any plant medicine. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I am incredibly grateful for Dr. Gabor Mate and the plant medicine because it was a, it really played a vital role in my healing journey. Yeah. Wow. So, so you said that this was so 2007 is when you were diagnosed. So 2013 is when you did your journey. So six years you had been going through everything, uh, the ringer you've done, you surrendered yourself by giving your power away. This is really interesting by giving your power away to, <laughs> yeah, to the doctors yeah. and, and did everything that they said because you, would you say you blindly trusted them? Probably. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't want to do the chemotherapy. I resisted the chemotherapy, but my children were young. They were eight and 10 years old. And I had what's called vascular invasion, which means that there were cancer cells on the walls of my veins. And so they said to me, as the blood flows through your veins, those cancer cells can be pulled away from the walls and they can end up in your big toe for all you know. And that was, that was the thing that changed my mind because initially I said no to chemo. And I thought, I cannot leave my children without a mom. I cannot leave my, fa my husband as a single father. And so, that, so I chose for them. I chose chemotherapy for them. That's so powerful. Yes. So, so, so the pressure and, and the dedication and, and the, the love and the, the altruism of supporting people you care about that isn't you kind of motivated you to do something in a, in a, fear, in a, in a, in a place where you really were a little nervous. You didn't know what to do. And then tell me about how you said that he used the fear tactic on you. Like the 30 minutes this doctor mentioned to you um, how, how yes. he had assumed that you were going to do the surgery. He had yeah, so that was talking about the schedule. Tell me about that. Yeah, so that was in um, January of 2017 when we met with the surgeon, when I had the recurring cancer. And when I said no to surgery, he said to me, he said, if you don't have that tumor removed, it will spread to your bones. It will spread to your ribs. And you will there is nothing that we're going to be able to do and it's going to be terminal. And, and I said, I, it just doesn't feel right to me. Surgery is not an option at this time. I did say to him, maybe down the road, I'll be open to it, but not at this time. And then he wanted me to meet with other doctors to see if other doctors could talk me into it. And, um, you know, and, and do genetic testing and all these things. And I just said, no, not at this time, not at this time. And he, I was, he was very frustrated when, you know, when I, when I left his I was office, frustrated. but I was, I was very calm. He was frustrated because he couldn't convince me, but I was so sure because I had meditated on it and I was so sure that this was the right choice for me, that I was really calm and was I was very lucky. Was My husband it all to you. Was he forceful? Was he, did he make any like, uh, I'm just curious, was he um, aggressive at all? Um, no, he, he used the fear factor, but he wasn't, um, yeah, he wasn't aggressive. So you got a but good I time. could tell he was getting more and more frustrated with me, for sure, for sure. He wasn't being friendly, that's for sure. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And, I, and my husband said to me, whatever you choose, I support you. And that was huge. Yes, that was huge. So you mentioned your husband a few times, and it seems like he has been a major supportive role for you in this process. Um, mm -hmm. How would you say that uh, his, his impact has supported you? Like, how, how has it been having him there? Do you think uh, it made a difference? 
Oh my goodness, absolutely. I, uh, I have always been someone who would run circles around people half my age and I would brag about that, right? I was just this energizer banner, just go, go, go. I now realize that it all had to do with me needing to prove myself because I didn't feel worthy. My husband is very grounded and very solid and he's quieter and he's, um, he's not out there trying to prove himself. And that was, a, that was huge in my life to have someone like him to help me because if I was married to someone who was more like me, pretty sure I wouldn't be here anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was my rock. So he why, was. why do you think you wouldn't be here? Just so I understand that. That's, that's a big statement. Because like I said earlier, I was, I was like a pressure cooker on the inside and I was just go, 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 go all the time. And he would say to me, do you really need to put that on your plate? You know, if I decided to do yet another event or volunteer for this or join that. And so he would try, you know, he would do his best to just keep my schedule a little calm. But if I had been married to someone who was like me, yeah, that pressure cooker would have exploded for sure. For sure. It would have gotten out of balance. Yeah. So he was my, my, you know, it's the yin and the yang, right? Wow. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, the, the pivotal, one of these pivotal points was you connecting to your, your intuition by doing this ceremony. Can you tell me a teeny bit more about what happened that, that changed inside of you? What happened with, and th for those who don't know, there are many different types of ceremonies, but traditionally, this is this is a plant medicine that has been done for hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of years, in deep in the jungles in South America, and um, the Amazon, yeah, the Amazon in Peru, and that this is mm -hmm. a tradition where people people, I mean, hopefully with good intent, are coming together to um, to learn and, and to be a student of this plant. Uh, and it's actually two different plants mixed together that yeah. uh, that made into a tea. You just boil these plants together in a in a big pot like soup, yeah. and then it makes it. You boil it down to a really yeah. concentrate, and it becomes a tea. And you just take a little bit of that tea, and and I cringe just by the thought of it because <laughs> it tastes so <laughs> awful. It's it's a yes. strong, unique. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's thick. it's thick anyway yeah so so <laughs> traditionally this is done in the evenings uh late evenings in the nighttime and it's for ayahuasca yes 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 yeah. and yeah. It's traditionally also um there is a a, a medicine man or a woman and oh, a shaman someone who's hopefully trained initiated and and has really done their own w works on their wounds and and resolved a lot of things to where the point the focus doesn't need to be about them their right. presence is there to hold safety and and protection and contain the mm -hmm. facilitate for others to go into their um darkest wounds their their negative their shadow or their pain or yeah. their bliss or to the the light uh to, to a, a lot of different things and every unique person is individual uh, and it has their own unique journey but way one shaman in, explained it to me is this is a this is a relationship that your intelligence and your consciousness is learning and communing and connecting with uh, this plant spirit this the essence and the intelligence of the of, of the living being of these two plants together and mm -hmm. that relation, what happens is eight hours of that relationship communing together. And, and she's referred to as the grandmother. And the grandmother yeah. is, think of the loving, gentle wisdom and patience of, of a grandma. It it's, it's really is that energy, would, would you say? It can be very gentle. And then it can be not so gentle as well. It all depends on the ceremony, right? Yes. No, they, um, ayahuasca has also been referred to as the vine of the soul. Mm -hmm. And I did say to Gabor at one point, I said, 
ayahuasca is actually pretty gentle with me compared to some of the other people that were in ceremony at the same time who were, you know, I could tell that they were not having a gentle time with it at all. And Gabor said to me, he said, you know, you're a pretty gentle person and it's you interacting with your soul. So of course it would be gentle. That was his response. So I said, okay. So for the most part, it was gentle with me, but it was also, it could be very intense and life-changing, life-altering. You know, Ayahuasca said to me at one point, gave me a message that I have repeated often to myself and to others. You are worthy simply because you are born, period. And that message hit home for me because I was that person that needed to prove my self-worth. I needed to be fit. I needed to be skinny. I needed to work a lot. I was a people pleaser. All of it was to prove my self-worth. All of it was out of fear of rejection. And Ayahuasca said to me, nothing that you've done or not done determines your self-worth. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're skinny or overweight. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white. You are worthy simply because you were born. And I remind myself that all the time. I do. When my ego creeps up and I'm swimming laps in the pool, which is what I love to do, and I try to beat someone who's swimming in the next lap, I'm like... I don't need to beat this man or this woman. I'm still, I'm still worthy. I've got nothing to prove, you know? So I, I, I remind myself almost daily of that very powerful sentence. Yeah, yeah. And Wishuma also has been very powerful for me as well in many, um, in many ceremonies. But one in particular was life-changing, and that is... Uh, Wishuma or San Pedro, it's known as, you do during the day. And I was in the Canadian Rocky Mountains, sitting outside by a lake, looking at this gorgeous view of the Rockies in ceremony, sitting on a log. And the message that came through was, do not let cancer stop you from living your dreams. And so this was um, September 2017. So I had been... Um, you know, trying to heal my body of recurring cancer since December. So what is that, about 10 months or so? And that was the message. Don't let cancer stop you from living your dreams. Now, my husband and I had a dream of traveling the world. And I said to my higher self in the conversation, well, we can't afford it. We've spent so much money on treatments, we can't afford it anymore. Sell your house was was the answer. And I got so excited. I was more excited than I'd been all year. I thought, wow, like we could actually do this. We could travel the world, sell our house, and then proceeded to say, sell everything, get rid of all your stuff. So I went home after the ceremony and I said to Ian, my husband, this was the message, sell our house, get rid of our stuff and start traveling. Are you ready? And my husband said to me, am I ready? He's like, I've been waiting for you for 30 years. Let's do this. And so we spent five months getting rid of 30 years worth of stuff. We sold our house. And on February 6, 2018, we started traveling. And um, I, it, was a, it was a very beautiful spiritual journey. I tried all kinds of funky things in different countries to try and heal my body. And uh, Real quick, it was the question. Yes. So you said 2018, there's one big event that happened um, in between your first ceremonies or couple ceremonies and 2018. And you said in 2016, you went back and got retested to, and, and you still had a malignant cancer. Is that right? In 2016? 2016 is when I found out that the cancer had returned. Right. So, yes. so that the, yeah. we, we didn't say that part. I just want to say, so from, did you think it was gone before then? After no, the chemo? I knew it wasn't. Did oh, they? so no, no. So, so this is what, so, okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. 
And so when I met with that surgeon in 2000, January of 2017 to talk about having a, a, a mastectomy, he said to me, um, the cancer is in the same location as it was 10 years prior, and it's the same type, so it likely never left your body. And I said, well, how can that be? Because I had it surgically removed, then I had it poisoned with chemotherapy, and then I had it burned with radiation. And he said, well, sometimes cancer can be so resilient, cancer cells, that it can dodge the, the surgery and it can outlive the treatments. And he said, and that, those, those cancer cells, those resilient cancer cells are what has multiplied and into a tumor three times larger than the tumor that I'd had in 2007. And so I went home and I said to my husband, if these resilient cancer cells dodged the surgery and outlived the treatments, what makes this surgeon think that it's going to work this time? Because it didn't work in 2007. And so, you know, Einstein's quote, you know, doing something and over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. That quote came to mind. And I thought, pretty sure I'm not insane yet, anyway. <laughs> and so that was a big reason as well why I didn't choose surgery. And I mean, chemotherapy was off the table right from the get-go. I had no desire to do chemotherapy. And uh, yeah, and so that was the yeah, um, beginning of the time, year, yeah. At this time, you probably, you said you had used a lot of your funds and, and financial resources and you had exhausted them. And um, so did you- Okay, so that, so that was in September. So not to confuse the, right? So December 2016, I was diagnosed with recurring cancer. Yeah. In January, I had the meeting with the surgeon, decided I'm gonna do yeah. holistic all the way. In September, I did the ceremony with, with, with Shuma or San Pedro, where I got the message, don't let cancer stop you. Between January and December, I had spent tens of thousands of dollars on different kinds of holistic treatments and nothing was working. Yeah. I was getting tested and the tumor was not really shrinking and it just, it wasn't working. And so in September, we made the decision, okay, let's sell our stuff and let's hit the road. And we started traveling. It took five months to get rid of everything. And we started traveling in February of 2018. Wow. And we traveled for 15 months. Amazing. Yes. And yes. So that right there, that Wachuma was one of the, would you say it was a surrendering? Uh, it, was a, it was a big moment of surrender for you? Well, it was an easy surrender because I felt incredibly excited. I was just tingling all over. I was like, whoa, are you kidding? We could do this? We can travel the world? And all we, we just need to sell our house and that will fund everything. And yeah, yeah, I'm in. And thankfully, my husband was in as well. And so let's do it. And, you know, there was quite a few people that were like, what the heck are you guys doing? You know, you're crazy. Um, and then there were also lots of people that said, wow, I would love to do what you're doing. To which we always said, well, do it. What's stopping you? Right? Do it. And yeah. And this... 15 months of traveling we traveled in mexico in europe and in asia and uh it was it was a bit of a wild ride yeah, so was, yeah. Did, were you doing any of those you said you had spent a ton of money on a lot of natural treatments um just briefly what were a couple things you did and then did you do any of them while you traveled so i was getting vitamin c through iv every week twice a week i was getting glutathione through IV, chelation through IV. I was getting colonics. I had bought a sauna bed, and so I was doing saunas at home every day. I was doing enemas. I had a vibration machine that I stood on because that's really good for the, the yeah. lymphatic system. So I was doing that every day. I was juicing. I tried all different kinds of diets the keto diet, the vegan diet, uh, vegetarian, all kinds of different things I tried. Um, I even attempted the urine therapy. Mm -hmm. I didn't get too far with that. 
Um, but I, I, I did give that a little bit of a try. You, you I'm drinking my own urine. <laughs> when was it that, this is really interesting. Um, when was it that you had, you had gone, I think you said you had gone up quite a while without having natural bowel movement. Right. So throughout the whole ordeal, the whole, you know, almost just a little over two years that I was trying to heal my body of cancer, I was incredibly constipated and it got worse and worse and worse. And so when I was in Asia, it got really bad. And for three months, I relied on enemas. That was the only way I was able to have a bowel movement. And um, I had the odd colonic in Asia. If I found a place that, you know, looked reputable and, and clean, then I would have a colonic. But for the rest, I did, uh, I did enemas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was during your pilgrimage. Uh, or, no, at what point, where, when did your pilgrimage to India happen? Because there was a huge shift when you did that. Yes. So in December of 2018, uh, which was about six weeks after I started my surrender practice, I was in India for a pilgrimage. And it was a beautiful, beautiful retreat that I was at. And the pilgrimage was at Mount Arunachala. And uh, Ramana Maharishi is the sage who was there. He's passed away now, but um, you know that's that's where he um, practiced, and uh, it was beautiful. And all of these things came up, including a nightmare, a terrifying nightmare. And I woke up in terror. And it turns out that it was a past life where I was being chased by a soldier and raped in the woods. And this soldier had the energy of my father. Now I had been struggling. My father and I did not have a good uh, relationship at all. And he was the bully and I was the victim. And, and I remember thinking, holy cow, really? You know, I don't have enough to deal with in this lifetime. I got to take other lifetimes in with me too. And so after that nightmare, I couldn't get back to sleep. And so I decided to do breath work, something that I had learned while I was in India, and to activate the Kundalini. And it was the most amazing experience because it was as if there was a, an electrical current going through my body. And I just laid in bed and allowed this current. And I, I, I had no concept of time, but I just allowed this electrical current to pass through my body. And then when it was done, I needed to go to the bathroom. And after not having been able to have a bowel movement for a long time on my own, I had an in amazing, you know, maybe too much information, but it was, um, oh, no, we, <laughs> it, it, it was incredible. And I thought, oh my gosh, all this terror was stuck in my colon and my intestines. And I just released it. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. Did you, Yeah. when you say terror relief, like, could you tell there was less, a little bit less terror in your being as you like, breathed and did that exercise? Oh, absolutely. When, when I activated the Kundalini and that electric, electric uh, current went through my body, I could feel, I could feel all that terror leaving my body. Yeah, at an energetic level. Yeah, it was, it was remarkable. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it didn't, uh, so I had that one amazing bowel movement, but then I went another like three months without being able to have another bowel movement. So here I thought, okay, my colon is healed. I'm good. But that wasn't the case. I still had more fear to let go of and more shit to let go of literally. <laughs> well, really quick. Some people don't understand what that's like. Um, when you can't have a bathroom on your own, they think that like, you don't really identify with that. Would you say, what was that like? I mean, was it, did it, did it hurt? Was there challenging? Was it challenging? Like, was it, did it affect your mood? Like, what was it like to not be able to go to the bathroom for three months? Twice. It was frustrating. And I remember thinking, is this something that I have to deal with for the rest of my life? 
And it was at the end of March, so a year ago, that I started doing some of Dr. Joe Dispenza's uh, meditations. And one of them is called Blessing the Energy Centers, which really focuses on all the energy centers, including the lower ones. And it, it released it released some heavy energies that were stuck in my lower energy centers or chakras. And I started going to the bathroom. I had to stop my meditation halfway through every single day to go to the bathroom. And I have not needed an enema since then. I have, and, and I still, to this day, feel so much gratitude and I feel so light every time I have a bowel movement. It's like, it's a celebration every single time still. <laughs> I have a turn in my program with, which I help people do with that. With that. I help people um, have bowel movements and we, we have a funny name called post poop euphoria. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I get it. I get it. I totally get it. And it's been a year and I'm still like, oh, that was so good. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah. Eliminate. Yeah. It's like that euphoric is like to reinforce the pleasure of being able to let go. It's like, yeah. It was extra. It's like, how much better is it when you don't have extra? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It reminds yeah. me actually, um, the Tao Te Ching, one of one of the great books, says it's better to be um, better to stop short than it is to fill to the brim. Just as a general piece of wisdom, better to stop short than fill to the brim. And it's very interesting because it's a similar inverse relationship. It's like as you empty out, it's like ah, oh, you feel all the benefits of being clear. Yes, yes, yes. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. So what, you said you started a surrender practice. What did you mean by that? Um, well, so ayahuasca in ceremony and Mishuma both had said to me on numerous occasions, surrender, surrender, surrender. And I was like, I don't know what the heck that is. I don't know what surrendering is. I don't, you know, I just couldn't get it. And then in October of 2018, I received news that the cancer had spread and that I had active cancer in my um, cervix and in my uterus. And the thing was, is that in 2017, and, and when I was initially diagnosed with breast cancer, they did a bunch of other tests and they said to me, there are red flags in your reproductive area. But at that point, I said, you know what, I don't want any more biopsies because biopsies can actually spread cancer. And I am planning on healing my body holistically and that is part of the whole. And so I refused to acknowledge or I was in denial. I was in denial. And sure enough, October 2018, I found out that it was in fact cancerous. And so I was faced with stage four cancer, you know, and that brought me to my knees that news and i was devastated and i remember i was in meditation and i had been meditating lots and i was in meditation and i said i was crying and i'm like i don't know what to do anymore i don't know what to do anymore show me and the show me was the surrendering yeah that, that were you at this time also experiencing the the heart palpitations, the insomnia, the jitters, and the, and the thyroid stuff, is that also at this time? Um, that kind of, that was kind of just par for the course because I had thyroid issues. I was on thyroid medications at that point, but um, yeah, and that was something that I had dealt with even before my cancer diagnosis. Wow. Those, were all, those were all symptoms that I was ignoring. Mm. Had I had I paid attention to them, um, I possibly could have nipped everything in the butt, but I ignored everything. I was in denial. Wow. I kept saying, no, I'm good. I'm good. There's nothing going on here, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you were... I, go ahead. So, so going back to the surrendering, I was literally saying in meditation, I don't know what to do anymore. Show me. And something shifted in me and I realized 
it was kind of my higher self, I guess. I'm, uh, but anyway, I realized that I needed to acknowledge everything, every emotion, every fear, every anger, every shame, every guilt, every regret. I needed to acknowledge and hold space for everything. And that I had, in fact, pushed everything down and swept it under the rug. And that I had done that for years. It was my survival mechanism and it had festered into tumors. And so that's when I started to surrender. I realized that surrendering was letting go of resistance, resistance to all emotions. And so I held space, compassionate, loving, forgiving space for everything. And so I started meditating three hours, four hours a day. And I would choose, for example, um, a big one. One of the first ones that I meditated was on was uh, my fear of dying. And so I would, I, would, I would go there and I would allow myself to feel that fear. And then I would really juice it up even. And I would imagine myself on, on, uh, you know, on my deathbed. And I would allow myself to cry and I would allow myself to just really, really feel the fear. And then I tell myself, it's okay that I feel this fear. I'm allowed to feel this fear. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And what happened, the more that I allowed myself to feel this fear, eventually it started to dissipate. And I realized, and I, this is how I explain it. So the fear is a vibration that's low. It's down here. The energy of being okay with it, the compassion, the forgiveness, the allowance is our higher consciousness, really, and it's a vibration that's up here. And so as I was, my higher vibration was saying, it's okay, you're allowed to feel the fear, it's okay, go ahead, feel it, it's okay, it's okay. It was literally beckoning the fear up into the light, right? And after a while, the fear dissipated. And what happened was that my fear of death and dying disappeared and it became a non-issue and I was okay with dying I had let go of the resistance to dying I had surrendered to dying and interestingly enough when I had let go of that resistance I started to live I started to truly live because I had no fear of dying right and then I had to surrender my needs to be healthy, right? And my need to prove myself. And I had to surrender anger. I had anger towards my body. I had anger towards my father that I had not allowed myself to feel, that I hadn't acknowledged. So my surrendering practice is really an acknowledging of all the emotions and holding space for them, being okay with them, allowing myself to feel them, and literally that would bring it up into the light of consciousness. And then I would just bathe myself. So I realized that once I felt, let's say the fear dissipate, I would be just kind of floating and loving life. And I would just bathe myself in this beautiful energy, this high vibration. And that's when I realized, you know what? This is the vibration of love and love heals. This is the vibration of my inner healer. And so I would just float around and then I would visualize myself, you know, healthy and happy and joyful. And yeah, that's what I did every single day, every single day. And it was less than four months later of only just doing that, just surrendering, meditating. And it was less than four months later that I got the news that there was no active cancer in my body. Wow. Did you go to the same doctor? No, I actually was in Thailand and I was in Chiang Mai, which is quite renowned for holistic healing and Ayurvedic healing. And I went to this um, beautiful place called the, the Tao Garden, which is really, it's mostly Western people that go there for healing. And there was quite a few um, Western doctors there as well, but I had a lot of tests done. And that's where I found out that there was no cancer in my body, no active cancer in my body. Wow. So you really yeah. stopped doing a lot. You stopped a lot of doing 
and you did a lot of being and then you did a lot of inner yes. work. It was, it was like, the inner work. It was the inner work. And that's when I realized that fear of rejection was at, at the root of most of my behavior. I, because of my relationship with my father, my father played the rejection game for, you know, yeah, most you of my life. He was a bully. Like, like, and, and, and I just want to say this for anyone who may hear your story. It's like, this isn't a small thing. Your relationship with your dad was pretty big. Yeah. And, and his negative impact on you and, and, and his bullying, I mean, led you to have a lot of anger and uh, fear, fear and, and, and things. Okay. Well, it, fear of rejection. Yeah. So I became a people pleaser. Don't rock the boat, you know, to keep him happy so that he would love me. But his love was conditional. And he a lot could of also be. Feel that. A lot of people are, are people who don't want to rock the boat. And a lot of people out there are people who want to keep everybody happy. And a lot yeah. of people are those who, who don't have the self-worth that they just want to make up. They want to please others to survive. But what would you say? What would you say to that type of person now that you're through that? What would you say to that version of you? To that version of you? Love yourself. Love what yourself. They don't love me? Like, so... So this is how I, what I realized. My father was my biggest gift. My father and cancer were my biggest gifts because he triggered that which was already within me. Lack of self-love, lack of self-worth, the rejection of myself. And as I was surrendering, and I write about this in my book, actually, as I was surrendering, I realized it had nothing to do with my father. It had nothing to do with my father's rejecting me. It had everything to do with me rejecting me. It had everything to do with me not loving me, me not feeling worthy. And so that became very empowering because that shifted um, me from being a victim to being empowered. Yeah, so I let go of a lot of victim energy. So anyone out there who has a difficult relationship with a, you know, a parent or a spouse or a sibling, look within, look within, because that, they, that which is not within you cannot be triggered, right? And so that lack of self-worth was already in me and my father triggered it. And when I let that go, and I had let that go, and the last time I saw my father, he's now passed away, but the last time I saw my father was this past spring in June, and he was playing his mind games with me. And it no longer affected me because I finally loved myself unconditionally, and he was not able to diminish that. And I realized then that I had truly healed. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell me? Can you tell me more about when you said he played mind games with you? And yeah, you, what does that mean? Mind games. He liked to play mind games. He would. Yeah. How would I explain that? He was very money oriented, and. Um, he had low self-esteem. I know he did. I can see that now, right? He didn't love himself. He was all about needing to prove himself. And he used money. Uh, he showed money. Sorry, he showed his love in the way of money. And so he would um, give my sister-in-law. He loved my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law essentially replaced me. And so wow. he pretty much, um, I could build in at, a, at an energetic level, he disowned me as a daughter, pretty much. Uh, we didn't speak for 10 years, and then we reconnected, thanks to ayahuasca, by the way. We reconnected because ayahuasca showed me um, that he was just a product of his environment, and yeah, I felt incredible I love for him. I wanted to definitely yeah. think this is so valuable for other people. Because while you were on the journey, you, you were surrendering, but part of what healed you was surrendering these specific issues around the dad. And, and then she showed you some glimpses, like you had some visions about his, his past. And can you share a little yeah. bit of that? 
Yes, so this happened in 2013 at the first um, retreat that I was at with uh, Ayahuasca. And Ayahuasca showed me a picture of my father that I actually have somewhere in a drawer. And it was where he was three years old. And he was born in 1939 in war-torn Europe. His father was an abuser. His mother was abused. And then he was bullied at school. But this picture of him, he's three years old, I think, and he is so innocent and so beautiful. And just this big smile on his face. And that is what I saw in the ceremony. And I felt such incredible love for him. And, a, and a, an understanding of why he became a bully that that was his survival skill because he was bullied at home. He watched his mother being bullied by his father and abused. And then he was bullied at school. And then he became the bully. And he continued to be the bully for the rest of his life because that was his survival skill. And he couldn't tell the difference between a would-be bully and the rest of society. So if he felt in the least bit threatened, he would charge and throw the first punch. And that's not a physical punch. He didn't physically beat us. It was words. Words and energy and overpowering and intimidation and whatnot. And so after 10 years of not speaking, I had tried on a, numerous occasions to reconnect with him and he had, no, he had no desire. He's like, nope, no interest. Don't want to see you. Don't want to talk to you. And so I had given up on it. After that ayahuasca ceremony, and Dr. Mate said, you know, he wasn't here. He wasn't here at the retreat. He didn't heal like you did. He probably will reject you again. And I said, yeah, and if he does, I'll be okay with it. Because I know that it's from fear. And I sent him a letter, and he responded saying, yeah, we should reconnect. And so we reconnected. But the undercurrent was still not good. It was still not good. Oh my yeah, God. But, but we at least were on talking terms again. Wow. So, yeah. But I had asked him. Oh, go ahead. Um, it's starting to break up just a little go ahead. on your side. Uh, the video is, but your audio is good. Um, okay. One of the things I remember okay. I wrote down when we chatted um, that you... You kind of base one your healing was a bit a lot about going from blissfully unaware to blissfully aware. Yes, yes. So I, if someone had asked me five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, on a scale of zero to ten, how happy are you? I would have told people that I was probably an eight or a nine because I was brilliant at stuffing everything down and not dealing with it. And so anything negative hit me, I would just sweep it under the rug, pretend that everything was great, put a big smile on my face and carry on. And so when I started surrendering and I started to dig up all of this stuff that I had buried, I went from blissfully unaware and started that path to blissfully aware. But that path was very difficult. I won't sugarcoat it. You know, the months where I spend hours and hours and hours allowing myself to feel shame, to feel guilt, to feel anger, to feel fear, everything, allowing myself to feel it. And it was, yeah, it was, um, it was quite a journey. But it took me to where I am now, which is blissfully aware. And the blissfully aware, the bliss in blissfully aware compared to the bliss in blissfully unaware, there is no comparison. It is night and day. It really is. And so I am so incredibly grateful because I didn't just heal my body of cancer. What happened was so much more magical than that, so much more incredible because I feel this in incredible gentleness and tenderness for myself and this expansiveness. And I feel this love for the people around me as well. And so I am just floating. I am floating and it's beautiful. I'm, I'm just in this state of bliss, not 24 seven, 
I do still have my moments, but then I surrender when I have those moments that, you know, when, when my ego acts up or, you know, a limiting belief comes up, I'm aware of it right away because I've really lived my life in very heightened awareness and I surrender it. I let it go. And then once it's gone, I'm back in this beautiful, blissful place. And it's a pretty, pretty magical place to hang out. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, is when you surrender and you're in this blissful place, I'm now at a place where I'm like, if the cancer came back, oh, well. If it doesn't come back, it's okay. Either way, I know I'm good. And so it's, what it's created is this inner peace. And so cancer isn't, doesn't affect this inner peace. Other people don't affect this inner peace. The weather doesn't affect, nothing affects this inner peace. You know, the coronavirus isn't affecting the inner peace. Nothing is. It is just beautiful. It's a beautiful space to be. Yeah. Wow. And so yeah. you've been cancer free for how long? A little over a year. Amazing. Yeah. And and this journey yeah. is so profound that you decided to write about it. So you said you wrote a book. Yes. Yes. Healed by cancer. Yeah. Wow. That title yeah. is so good. Like, wow. Healed by cancer. It's just because oh, the so cancer good. was the cancer was just a symptom. It really was. And if I didn't have cancer, I would not ever have dug up all of the shit that I dug up. I wouldn't have. I know I wouldn't have. I would have stayed oblivious. Yeah. So, you know, this is really a testament to how life brings up things for us to. It's kind. It's very similar to like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, kind of thing. You can. You yes. Can, you. Yep. You can show people the way, but you can't make them do the three or four hours of meditation and the, That's and right. the surrender practice. And 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 actually, yeah. so many people spent so many of their lot, so many of their lives, so many of their um, their lot, so much of their life, resisting and fighting and shoving it under yes. the rug. That their survival mechanism is is hardwired that way. It's it's like yeah. it, it is on autopilot and and. Yeah. It's on repeat. So to do something out of that takes a, uh, some sort of a monumental change or environmental change or like, I mean, it takes a really uh, a significant step or intervention or some way to be either internal intervention or external in inter intervention or maybe both mm -hmm. to be able to do this. And so you help people get through that. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm a coach. And uh, to use your words, I lead my clients to the water. And I will say to them right off the get-go, I can show you the way, but I can't do it for you. Right? I can't do it for you. And um, I have a couple of clients actually right now who both of them have found that bliss through surrendering. And that has given me so much joy, so much joy that this is possible. And obviously, if I can do it, every single human being can do it, right? And so this is my, my mission in life is to teach people how to surrender and to show them that surrendering, you know, it's kind of gotten a bad rap. It really has. And surrendering is so important and allowing yourself to be vulnerable is so important. And that is where inner growth happens. Yes. And that is what puts the ego in the back seat and your higher consciousness in the front seat of your life. Mm -hmm. This game called life. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, um, this is why I'm, I'm in the health field is because I believe that this is, is really, um, this is how we get to the root of things is, is this is going yeah. to the root level. And, and would, and when I, would you say that it takes, it takes us to take a, 
radical responsibility and self accountability in order to to do this type of work yes yes um it's not for the faint of heart <laughs> you know there is a an indian sage i forget his name he's passed away already as well but i heard um this this little analogy that i've um that that really registered with me and he he says, you know, imagine going into the woods and you see this adorable little cabin and you're like, ah, oh, you know, how cute, you know, I love this little cabin. And you walk up closer to it and you open up the door and you're like, wow, you know, I could live here. And then you dig out your flashlight and you start to shine your flashlight around the cabin and you see, oh, okay, there's some animal droppings and there's cobwebs. Okay, it's a bit of a mess in here. And then you're like, oh, there's there's a light switch so you turn the light switch on and the whole place floods in light and you realize it's an absolute disaster in this little cabin and this little cabin is our body is our is who we are is right and so this surrender the surrender practice that i do it's a big step of it is being aware creating awareness being aware of your reactions of emotions that come up of your self-talk and your talk to other people and um, your beliefs, right? And the more you become aware, the more you shine that flashlight around, the more you realize, okay, it's that whole being blissfully unaware before, right? You turn the flashlight around and then when eventually you turn the light on completely, you're like, whoa, because I, as I was going through this, this journey of healing my body, there was many times that I thought I was taking a hundred steps backwards. And I, I remember saying to my husband, I feel like I have multiple personality disorder. Like I was just a mess. And so just being okay with that, allowing yourself to be a mess and allowing yourself to just feel the anger, the fear, whatever comes up, hold space for it and no judgment nothing but patience and compassion and forgiveness towards self. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is what I do with, um, with my clients is I guide them and, and I help them become more aware because the thing is, is who we are is programmed. 95% of who we are is the subconscious programming. And so much like I was unaware, most people are unaware right? Because it's the subconscious programming. Yeah. And so you're literally, I reprogrammed myself. I had a cancer causing identity that I let go of. And I let go of what I call the Jaka identity. I let go and I tapped into grace. And so it's about reprogramming, letting go of those old programs and, and um, you know, allowing yourself to be at peace and be okay with everything. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, a lot of people maybe end up seeing this or hearing this. And one of the things that I think is so important to name is, um, you, well, I think it's important, but, you know, P, you, let's take you in the past. You were, you were an expert at deceiving yourself. I was absolutely, I was brilliant at it. <laughs> and, and practiced. I mean, you had 30 years of practice, 38, 38 years of practice. Well, really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 51 now, and I only just discovered this a couple of years ago. So almost 50 years of, of doing this, this programmed behavior. Yeah. So, so would you say that, you know, it would, it would take, um, that you were capable of doing it all on your own? No, I took courses. I went to retreats. So I had some coaching myself to help me. And so this is what I was going to say um, that, you know, because we don't always notice it in ourselves, it's good to work with people because they can kind of point at say, oh, you know, is that a limiting belief? You know, is that belief working for you? And they're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, right? So that's kind of my role is to help them become aware of their words, of their thoughts, of their beliefs. And, um, and yeah, and then after a while, they are like, oh, yes, all day long. I was like, oh, no, that's, that's a limiting belief and, you know, and, and the attached emotions. And, and so 
people start to surrender on a daily basis. And I continue to surrender. And I don't just, uh, most of the surrendering I do at this point is not in meditation. It's actually right there in the moment. If I feel a thought or an emotion come up, whatever I'm doing, you know, if I'm out and about or I'm in the house, no matter what time of day, I stop. I become very present with it, very aware of it, and I hold space. And it dissipates pretty quickly at this point. Mm. Yeah. And do you use any prescriptions or, or, or do you use any, any drugs anymore? No. No. None. Why? None. I don't have to. I don't have to. I was able to get off the thyroid medication. I healed that as well. I had hypothyroidism. So I managed to get off that medication. And um, I healed my adrenals. I healed my intestines. I'm healed. I feel great. I have, I have an abundance of energy again. And everything is flowing through. I'm absolutely blissed out with life. And I feel such joy. So I don't need any medications. Wow. And so I have also surrendered, you know, and that's another surrendering is, is if I were to get to a place where medication would help me, I would meditate on that. And I'm not against medication. So don't get me wrong. I'm not against medication. But I am all for tapping in, checking in, and asking your intuition, your higher self, if, you know, will this benefit me, this medication? And wow. at this point, I don't need any. So I'm going to, I'm so happy for you. I just want to show people, <laughs> I want to show people this really quick. Um, I want to share, let's see here, can I share this? Can you see this? I can see this, yeah. Okay, so that's the cover of my book. <laughs> so anybody who feels inspired um, by this journey, anybody, um, well, I invite you to reach out to, to me, uh, Nathaniel. Or I, I'm Nathan Woods on Facebook, and uh, Jaka Duncan. This is her book. You can you can order it uh, right now live. We'll provide a yes. link there. Um, yes, it's, it's available as uh, Kindle and um, in print as well. And uh, yeah, and, and it's available on Amazon around the world. Sorry, no <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's you can pick it up right now for your Prime membership. It'll be there by and tomorrow or the next day. And mm -hmm. uh, if anybody wants to, you know, really doesn't want to do this on their own and is stuck, um, stuck, you know, with their own limiting beliefs, or is looking for someone who's truly going to love them enough to keep them accountable, someone who's going to call them in a loving way on, on the less you know, limiting beliefs, and yeah. someone who's been through it, someone who identifies it, someone who can help you love yourself uh, and help you. Un if you yes. were like her, you don't know what surrender is. If you don't know what it means to be vulnerable, if you're, um, you know, you're, you're afraid of the process, you're afraid of what your doctor said, you're afraid of what um, the, the medications and the surgeries, if you're going to die, like you were there, there's mm -hmm. some other options. There's other ways. And, um, and yes. this is a story that shows you, you can absolutely heal yourself. Um, yes. And, and can I just add that this book is all about surrendering. It just so happens that I had cancer, but that is not, you know, whether you have cancer or you have heart disease or you struggle with obesity or mental health or MS or ALS or none of the above, you know, if you're struggling with depression, it, surrendering benefits everybody. It just so happened that cancer was my symptom. Yes. So, so this book will benefit not just people with cancer. It will benefit everyone. That's my belief. I, yeah. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the people can find you at inner, uh, your website is inner, yes. um, outer wealth, wealth, w inner health. Yeah. Inner health, outer wealth, coaching.com. Got it. Inner health, outer wealth, coaching.com. Yes. Because when you're healthy on the inside, 
You're wealthy on the outside. You are abundantly wealthy on the outside. Yes. And um, and Jenka is a motivational speaker. So she, if you liked her story and you felt it motivating, she offers motivational motivational speaking services. You mm -hmm. can reach out to yes. either one of us, and we can put you in contact so she can come at your yes. event or or your yeah. podcast. She also is a podcast guest and podcast host I think you're a host right yeah I I host I co-host a podcast and uh, and I blog and everything is on my website including I have seven different topics that I talk about um, and I'm open to other topics as well uh, that I can uh, speak on you know I, I'm struggling with an eating disorder so I I, I do a I do on that and, and plant medicine obviously and um, love the power of love you know how love heals and surrendering and yeah yeah and following uh following your dreams you know so all i have lots of different um topics I that i can it. talk about yeah this is what i live for and and uh you know coming from a background where a lot of people everyone in my family had a, a lot of limiting beliefs and a lot of fear and uh and mm -hmm. um weren't wanting to live their dreams they were stuck in the nine to five they were you know kind of condemned uh, to be in their thing this is so inspiring on so many levels and and yeah. I know your career as a speaker is just getting started and and one of the reasons yes. I I absolutely see you on Oprah I already see you. <laughs> I see you being out there all over the news all over you know TV just sharing your vision your mission and just being an, a light and a pillar of light um you know, out there Thank you. doing your thing. And um, yeah, well, um, I love Oprah. So I would love nothing more than to be able to give her a big hug. Yes. I should visualize be, it now. And she would be honored by your, your story and your journey. And just as mm. I am honored by your story. And thank your, you. And thank you uh, for yeah. taking the time to share it with me and uh, share your journey and write it. I mean, it's so powerful that you even wrote it. Like, not everyone's going to take the time to relive it so many times to make a book. Like, yes, like you know, the book, the book itself was part of my healing journey. It was part of my surrendering journey because I talk about my inner world, something that I had covered up so carefully. You know, I didn't let people in to see the shameful bits and the angry bits and the fearful bits. I write about all of that. Yes. So exposing your so. inner world was part of your healing. And I just want to leave that with anyone listening. Yes. Yes. Part of what helped her heal was exposing her inner world. Yeah. The dark and the light alike. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So honored yes. to you. Is there, uh, was there anything else you'd like to share before we sum I think, it up? I think this is wonderful. I thank you so much, Nathaniel. I am so grateful for you. Glad that we stumbled across each other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to the listeners as well. And so you guys can reach me uh, through my Facebook. Uh, you can also reach, reach me at, at meet me, M E E T uh, dot M E slash Nathaniel. So it's M E E T meet me or meet there's a dot in between me at uh, slash Nathaniel. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, yes. that you can reach me or on Facebook. And if you have any questions for Jenka and, and you like to connect to her, I'm available. I'm happy to connect you to her. And uh, Yeah, and you can find me on Facebook too, Jenka Duncan. I'm easy to Jenka, find. And, and for those listening, it's yeah. J-A-Y-K-A Duncan, D-U-N-C-U-N. C-A-N. C-A-N, Duncan. So D -U -N -D -U -N. Duncan. D-U-N. Yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you. You take care. Bye bye.